Thanks um, for having me. I got up this morning and um, thought that maybe there had been a huge mistake made having me here and that um, maybe someone was going to lose their job. I don't know. You can probably decide that later. So it's a little intimidating, um, all, these, all you fresh-faced uh, people here on an early morning, um, because I, I'm, I'm at an age where I, I, uh, I no longer harbor any illusions about being the smartest person in the room. And I'm also at an age where I'm wishing that I'd made the font size a little bigger on my notes. <laughs> um, uh, so that was a really nice introduction. I, I, I uh, have um, I've been very fortunate in my career. I've been on records with you know, people like the Grateful Dead and uh, Jim James and John Mayer and stuff like that. And a lot of that is attrition because you just stay around long enough, you're going to bump into people. Um, but I, I've often wished that, uh, I've often said that in my next life, I want to have a job where I don't have to go around telling people how awesome I am. <laughs> uh, because that's, a, that's a, an unfortunate part of being a musician in the 20th and 21st century. So the topic today is robotics. And I can quickly tell you everything I know about robotics, and that is the word servo. And I don't even really know what a servo is. I mean, I think, is servo an acronym? You don't even know. All right, I feel a lot better, actually, about that. Um, so I, I, I do have some, um, some thoughts about how automation and technology impact uh, my life as a as someone who composes and performs music and if you're someone who does something creative I think that you'll be able to draw parallels for yourself but I won't I'm gonna assume that you all know what a metaphor is and I won't draw that line for you is that okay <laughs> all right um, so I'll I'll dive right in so Einstein famously said any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic Right? Right, well, if you're like me, most of you, which I suspect were instantly dubious because all, if all the quotes attributed to Einstein on the internet were put together, he wouldn't have had time in his lifetime to say them all, right? So Einstein didn't actually say that. That was Arthur C. Clarke, who was a, science, a, a very prescient science fiction writer. Um, and I, I, there's two things I think about that. One is that the fact that any advanced technology seems like magic makes it very attractive. Even if we consciously know it's not magic, it still seems like magic. When I pick up my phone and my wife is FaceTiming me from Budapest, that seems like magic to me. Um, the other thing is that in another setting, if someone had thrown out an Einstein quote like that, I know if I were sitting in the audience, my mental hand would have gone to my pocket for my phone because I would want to Google it and see if it was actually right, right? <laughs> So thanks for not doing that. Actually, I think this place is like a Faraday cage. I don't think you can even get that. So that's awesome. <laughs> I'm going to tell you all kinds of stuff that you're not going to be able to verify for hours. <laughs> but, I, but I do wonder, as someone who grew up, like when I was a kid, we had a phone on the wall. you know. And if you wanted to talk on the phone, you stood by the phone by the wall. And you know, when I was in college, wireless phones came on. And we were like, wow, I can stand in the backyard, I mean, close to the door in the backyard and talk on the phone. That was amazing. And now we have phones that you can be in an airplane and sometimes, you know, whatever. And I wonder what kind of impact that has on people growing up with the fact that all of the accumulated knowledge in the history of the world is now right here in my pocket. And what that does to your psyche. And, uh, and it's not necessarily bad. It might be great. I think some of us who have seen before and the after um, struggle with that a little bit. Um, so I, I'm, not, I'm not someone who thinks that technology is fundamentally negative. 
I think the assumption of our culture is that technology is fundamentally positive. And I don't think either of those is true. There are a lot of things about technology I love. Um, aspirin is technology. A pencil is technology. The fact that I can buy guitar strings for my guitar that are accurate to within a thousandth of an inch is also technology that I'm very grateful for. Um, the fact that we're still measuring it in thousandths of an inch instead of a centimeter is maybe something that we need to think about. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how technology in, informs my world. And, uh, and, and we'll do a little thought experiment. So in the old days, in um, a recording studio, you had a big sort of refrigerator sized thing that was a tape machine, right? You've probably seen pictures of it. Had a had big thick uh, magnetic audio tape on it. It was two inches thick and it's basically mylar sprayed with oxide particles. And through a series of semi-magical processes, a little magnet would vibrate that and put a pattern on that tape and it would record music. And this again was pretty miraculous. Um, but you had to, if you wanted to take those individual tracks that you would recorded and mix them, if you wanted to change those as you went, you had a little, a little board, and you guys have all seen like a little mixing board. It's got volume controls that are like sliding faders. And you would do this little dance. And it was very much a dance because it had to be in time to the music. And you would be, I, I can remember working at, <clears throat> at Daniel Lanois studio in New Orleans, and there would be 35 faders, and there would be four of us all doing like, okay, now when the second chorus comes in, you've got to run over here and push this button. And then this person has to go over here and do this. So there was this like, this like musical interactive dance that you would do to get a good mix. And you'd have to do a mix 10 or 12 times to get it right. Because someone would inevitably push something too far or not far enough. And we would do little tricks like we'd put a little piece of artist tape across the fader so that when you pushed it up, it would only go so far. Or we'd put little marks, one, two, three, four, and you'd move the fader up to one here and back down to two here and up to four here and the next chorus. And um, it was a lot of good, clean fun, but there was a lot of time wasted because when the tape's running, you only have a limited number of uses of the tape and you, you're paying by the hour. Studio time's very expensive. So they came up with a thing called tape-based automation, which is awesome in its awfulness. <laughs> so in those days, you had you know, the, the track. I, I don't want to get too much into the technology of recording, but in a two-inch tape, it would essentially be divided into certain areas. So one track would be at the top, the next track would be in the middle, and the tape head would just read individual tracks. So what you would do is sacrifice one track to the god of automation. And it would record a sound that was kind of like an FSK, like a modem kind of sound on that track. And your, your fancy mixing console would read that, and the faders would move on their own. You know, and this was like, wow, could not believe this. I mean, people would do this in the studio just to wow clients, you know. Check this out, and the faders would go. <laughs> But the deal is, in those days, there's a, there's a gap between the playhead and the record head. So if you can picture the machine, one head is actually moving the magnetic particles, and the next one's reading it. But there's a little gap. And your tape is turning at about 15 inches per second, so there's a little bit of a time lag between those two. So the problem was, when you started recording this automation, it would only stay in that place for one pass. So if you were like, okay, we're going to get the vocal levels right on this one. So you go through and you get the vocal levels right. Then you're like, okay, well, let's, the drums need a little bit of tweaking. So we'll do the drums on this take. So you'd go over to the drum area of the console and you do those. But by the time you did that, now the vocal one was a little behind because of that gap in the tape. So you wound up in this situation where you would try to do everything a little bit early, knowing that as it went, the process was going to make everything slightly later. So by the, end of the, by the end of the thing, if you did 10 passes, your automation might be off by 100 milliseconds or 150 milliseconds, which isn't a lot, but it's enough. So you had this ridiculous dance where you would try to, you'd try to anticipate how early you needed to do something so that later it would be right in the right spot. So that was the kind of crazy stuff that we did to try to um, use automation. And I'll talk a little bit more about how it works now in, in just a minute. So I, th I teach a class at the conservatory um, and it's kind, of a, it's kind of a philosophy class about recording. And in that class we reference this article by um, 
architect Michael Graves. You guys are familiar with Michael Graves probably. He actually, I think he did his undergrad at UC, right? Or his master's or something. He has some connection with UC. Well, he wrote what I think is a wonderful article for the New York Times before. He actually uh, passed away this last year. But a couple of years ago, he wrote an article called um, The Lost Art of Drawing in Architecture. And I just happened to stumble on this. And I was just shocked at how parallel his world of architecture was with music. And I've, I've been a big architecture fan ever since reading, I'm embarrassed to admit it, The Fountainhead in college. I probably read it about 10 times. And it's, it's hilarious, just as a side note, I never had any idea of the, uh, the philosophical battle waged about those books. I, just, I honestly thought it was about an architect. Um, until like probably 10 years ago and all this like people hating each other about Ayn Rand. So anyway, that's, that tells you, tells you more than a little bit about me. But in, the, in this article, Michael Graves says, he talks about how when you're drawing, well, we'll put it this way. When we talk about recording or, or, or composing music, and you talk about this like sort of analog digital divide. And, and digital, it's important to remember that digital comes from the word digitus, right? Which is the Latin word for finger, which implies a certain amount of humanity. Uh, we've, come, we've sort of moved away from that, you know, the adjective form being digital. Um, but it's not, it's not so much about the sound of an analog thing versus a digital thing or an analog piece of film, the, the, the resolution of that versus a, a digital file. Um, I think there's a, there's a world in there of the process that leads up to what you're doing. Um, and one thing to think about is if you have a film camera and you take 36 pictures, how many of those pictures do you look at after they're developed? 36, right? You've got uh, a Nikon D50, and you just shot 2,400 pictures. How many do you look at? My guess is that X is less than 36, you know, or maybe, maybe 36. Um, so there's, a, there's something, and I'm not saying this is bad. I, want, I just want to look at the process of that. Um, what goes into, what goes into setting, setting those things up? And so back to this Michael, Michael Graves thing. He talks extensively about how just the way the neurons in your brain function is different when you're holding a pencil. When you're pushing that pencil across a piece of paper, it makes a sound. There's a vibration that happens in your hand. There's a way that your head is turned. There are a thousand things going on that are different, not necessarily better, but that are different than if you're sitting at a computer looking at a screen and typing. His, his take on it is that we may be losing something by not drawing. And it's, it's, a, it's an article worth looking up. But it inspired me to think about this in terms of my role as sometimes helping people with recording sessions. Um, and I, I will, I'll save that. I'll save that to the end, sorry. <laughs> so let's do a little thought experiment. Let's imagine that you are at a recording session in the middle of the 20th century. Say, I don't know, Dean Martin, let's say Frank Sinatra. Okay, you're at a Frank Sinatra, like, who wouldn't love that? You would show up at the studio and there would be probably 10 or 12 people functioning to assist you in this, in this thing. There'd be two engineers, they'd be wearing white lab coats because they're engineers. It's not a euphemism. These guys understand how electrons move. They understand how head gap affects the low end on a tape machine. They understand that 30 yips is different than 50 yips and that has an impact on the high. You know, they are actual engineers, not like today's engineers, um, uh, audio engineers. I apologize. Uh, there'd, there'd, be, there'd be an arranger who would be there who'd, whose job it is, is to make sure that the people playing the music parts are playing parts that are appropriate for the song or, or whatever's happening. So they're there to make sure that when the baritone sax come in on the second verse that his part isn't crossing with the singer's part, right? That's his job. 
His job is to make sure that everything got transposed into the right key and that everybody's playing the part that they're written. He's there. Then there's going to be someone there actually conducting the band or the orchestra. Uh, there's a guy in the corner who is standing in front of that refrigerator-sized tape machine. And his job is to push start, start, record, play. That's his gig. He's called a tape op. There's now, ironically, a magazine called Tape Op, which has nothing to do with running a tape machine, but a, an interesting recording magazine. Um, but that was, that was somebody's job. Like, what do you do? I'm a tape op. What do you do? Well, I push these three buttons all day. <laughs> and, and, you know, there would have been the producer, who's the guy who's kind of like overseeing the whole music. There might have been an executive producer, who was the guy who was paying the producer to do all that. Um, and that's before you had the musicians. So then you'd have a band, or, or pro, most likely an orchestra at the same time. You might have had 40, 50, 60 people playing. Not always. But the point is that when you walked into the recording studio, there were people there. Like, you didn't get up there and muck around. You didn't be like, oh, you know, I didn't really learn that part. Like, you were there. Someone's paying $1,500 a day. The studio executive is there. You're not going to fuck around. Like, you've got to get stuff done. Um, if you, if you take that and that, that two-inch tape that we talked about, that stuff is like $200 a roll. You know how much time you get for, for that? Somebody tell me. 16 minutes at 30 ips. You get about 16 to 18 minutes on a roll of tape. So if you're doing a record, that's a lot of rolls of tape. And I tell you this because I think that it affects what happens. When you went to the studio in those days, it was like going on the biggest date of your life. Like, people would get a haircut to go to the studio. <laughs> your teeth were brushed. You put on a suit. You had your shit together. You did not show up with your thing out of tune or with your strings bad, whatever. Like, people were counting on you. And if you screwed up, there were a lot of people there to make sure something happened. And you didn't get called back. So, that was a thing. I want to contrast that a little bit with a joke that makes the circles in, record, in the recording world. So do you guys know what Pro Tools is? Are you familiar with Pro Tools? OK, so Pro Tools is kind of like the Photoshop of the audio world. Um, it is the, it's the um, and I don't know that much about Photoshop, but Pro Tools is the industry standard. If I'm, if I'm in the studio and I need to send tracks to Norway, I send them a Photoshop file, or not a Pro Tools file. And that's kind of what we, it's kind of the thing that we, it's a lingua franca of uh, the audio world. So the joke is in the old days, uh, the engineer would have a little microphone in his thing and he would talk to the band and he would lean on the thing and go, gosh guys, that was terrible. Let's, let's do that again, right? So the joke is that today the guy leans on it and says, gosh guys, that was awful. Come on in. <laughs> right? Um, so today, commonly, um, if you show up for a recording session, you might be sitting in someone's basement with a laptop. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, and I tell my students at the university, you can make a great record with a laptop. It's just a lot more work, and you have to have a level of discipline. Like, if you think about the level of discipline that it takes to stand up in front of a room of 40 people who know about music and play your thing, like, you're going to have your game on. If you're in somebody's basement, you're like, oh, dude, I sort of didn't, you know, I, you know, we'll get it next time. We'll do 72 takes. Like, if you think of all the energy that it brings to something, like, I'm in a room with five people that I respect, and I've got to get this down. I've got to get it down now, or people are going to feel they're not going to like me. They're going to feel like I'm wasting their time and money. Like, it brings something to the process. And that's kind of... Um, that's kind of the thing that I wonder about with my class and in my own life. I had an online conversation with a musician that I respect a lot who said, we were talking about synthesizers. And I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in synthesizers, but I know, like, I have a friend who's very into analog synthesizers, and I know what they sound like. And I know that in, in the audio world, there's like a, lo a logic program that, that is a, a simulation of analog synthesizers. And he was like, oh, no, it's so inspiring. And I had this conversation with him, like, is it really inspiring or is it just convenient? And like, since when has great art ever been convenient? You know, like, 
Was Da Vinci convenient? Van Gogh convenient? I'm not sure convenience and great work go together. Maybe sometimes, I don't know. Um, I, think, I think that when you're doing great work and, and you, you know, Brian Eno's famous for saying, and he's not the first, to say that the restrictions that you have are what inspire your creativity. And, and then lately there have been, you know, some of those Steven Pinker books where he talks about how if you send someone into a store and they've got 72 kinds of jeans, you check back with them a week later and the jeans you bought, you're very likely to be unsatisfied with them. Whereas if you go into a store where they have three kinds of jeans, check back with them in a week, you're going to be very happy with your purchase. Digital gives us the chance to have 72 pairs of jeans all the time. And I think it, it, it can keep us from committing to something earlier in the process, which I do think is generally good. It keeps us from being prepared sometimes. It keeps us from making arrangements. And it can keep us from doing a performance, which in music is very important. In a, in a design sense, I'm not sure where all that lands. Um, uh, so I will, I will tell you one, one more quick story that a, a friend of mine who's a fine artist has works in MoMA and museums around the world went to give a lecture at a college, at, a design, at a, an art school. And he, his work is very labor intensive. His last, the last project that he did took him five years to complete. And this is someone who, I mean, his works regularly sell for high five, low six figures. And um, a student stood up and said, this really seems like a lot of work. Isn't, couldn't you just do that in the computer? And um, <laughs> right, right. So he's a, he's, a, he's a man of decorum in general. And he said, um, he said the, pro the only thing with that is the creativity in that was done by someone in Silicon Valley 10 or 15 years ago. And what you're asking me to do is just plug something into someone else's creativity. He said, I, I just, that, that doesn't interest me. And by the way, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> he said that the professor sponsoring it said, OK, and that'll end our lecture for today. <laughs> so that will end my lecture for today. But I do, I do want you to think about how convenience influences us in our, in our creative work. And that, that's really all I wanted to say. But, and I'm happy to take questions if you have any questions. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. So obviously for, for this instance, just me, just one person, the convenience is not, it's kind of a necessary evil. Like I use Ableton a little mm -hmm. bit, right? channel recorder mm -hmm. so you know I sit there and I program these stupid drums again using somebody else's creative idea drum machine in Ableton taking forever getting it right over and over again and then I finally get the guitar ah oh, that didn't work another take ah oh, another take ah oh, another take until I, I, I can't even see if I can scream mm. that's where the convenience of not paying for the studio I mean that that does sort of feed to a broke single person, mm. that convenience is sort of a necessary evil. Yeah, and I think that you're, I think that we're maybe talking about, in some sense, two different things. Um, I'm um, professional-ish, um, went to music school, like this is what I do all day, and I, I wouldn't want you to feel, I, I wouldn't want to put anything on you that like, like, I wouldn't want to be Picasso pissing on your finger painting. And I don't mean that in a negative way, in a, in a way to put you down, but like, you, I don't want to expect you to be hiring the best musicians in the world to do your home recording. Like, of course, that's great. And, you know, if you, um, I mean, we could have a larger conversation about culture and that if you're, if you're doing that and then selling that to someone as a commercial, like then I would have a problem with that, you know, because if you're if you're lowering the standard for everybody, then it would be different. But if you're doing it for your own enjoyment, who cares? And like I say, you can make a great recording like that. It just takes a huge amount of discipline. Um, it's like being in a classroom. Could you learn French on your own? Yes. Will you learn it probably a lot better and faster in a classroom? Yes. You know, how many people learn French on their own? Very few, unless they're in France. 
Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't mean to put anybody down who's doing recording at home. That's not my, that's not my thing. I just, what I would love to see is people to use the digital technology, but to take some of these tools that we have, we've built over 50 or 60 years and not abandon them, and to use this sort of positive peer pressure and the work ethic that went into that and use digital technology. Use the fact that it doesn't cost you $200 for 16 minutes. You know, take the best of both worlds, I guess. Yeah. That's a really good question. Yeah. 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 I would. I might argue with you about that. I know. I know what you're saying in front of the last five percent. I might say it's forty percent. Okay. But but yeah. No no. I I get it. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, uh, I think a couple things. One, I, I actually cut a little bit out of my lecture where I was going to talk about how we have um, sort of lowered our standard and how things sound. Um, and I, I don't want to be the curmudgeon guy because I, I really I'm not I'm not that person. I love I love the positive parts of technology and I embrace them. But when, when I was a kid, we would get a, an LP, and we would put it on the turntable, and we would sit in front of it with headphones, and we would listen to side one, and it was over, we might get a drink or go pee, and then we would flip it over and listen to side two. And that's what we did. Like, that's how we listened to music. That has certainly changed. Um, and I don't, it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard transition right now because not only has the audio quality gone down and the fact that if you compare even a CD or an LP to an MP3, the MP3 itself is, is a fairly crappy sound. Um, and again, if you think about, hey, you can fit a thousand songs on your phone. Who the hell needs a thousand songs in their phone? How many, I mean, how many songs do you really, seriously, a thousand, like, is it worth having crappy quality so you can have a thousand? I've got a thousand songs in my. I got ten thousand songs in my phone. Really? How many of them do you know? You know, I mean, how hard is it? any place you're in Wi-Fi? You can listen to anything you want. Like you got to have a thousand songs. So, I mean, a lot of us don't even know that you can have really high quality songs in your phone. You can put wave files in. If you have an iPhone or an Android, you can put wave files in there. You don't have to use MP3s. I've gone to the place now where I have very my my daughter's like, hey, we're in the car, let's put some music on. You have hardly any music in your phone. What kind of musician are you? I'm like I put three albums in there that I'm listening to. I don't have to have every, I don't have to have every Beatles song in there. You know I don't. So there's again that trade-off of convenience for quality. But the other part of that, which is even more discouraging, some days, is the quality of the headphones. So like you put you get these. And I understand that they have to do multiple things, but you get these awful headphones and they're playing MP3s. And, and, and my 12-year-old daughter, that's all she knows. Unless I make an effort, that's what she thinks is music. And I, it, it scares me because I put her in and I'm like, oh. She's like, what? I'm like, no, no. No, there's better. So like, you know, you can go out, honestly, here's a, here's a plug. There's a company called Grado, G-R-A-D-O, and they're in Brooklyn and it's a family and they make headphones. And it's like this old Italian guy and his three sons. And you can get a great pair of headphones for like $90. And, they're, and you can spend $1,000 on them too. They make very, very high-end ones. But their $90 headphones are amazing. And if you have children, please, for the children. <laughs> for the children, buy a pair of good headphones. Let your children listen to a good, a good sound. Put on a... Every, every child should know the fifth, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Every child should know Anna Klein and Nock music. Every child should know the Beatles. And they should be able to hear them in the beauty that they were recorded with. If you read about the Beatles, they labored over those recordings. They're so beautiful. And if you put them on an, your iPhone and an MP3 and those crappy little white headphones, oh, <laughs> baby Jesus cries when you do that. <laughs> yes? Uh -huh. So as a writer, I, you know, I got an MFA several years ago, um, 
every writer's dream is to write a book with pages in it, you know, the cover. <laughs> I remember that, those. <laughs> you know, people all the time are saying things like, oh, you should start a blog. If you're writing, you should start a blog. And, and I feel like some of these technological advances have begun to water down the industry. And no matter, you're talking about it from a musical standpoint, mm -hmm. I'm talking about it from um, a writing standpoint, whereas you can get instant credibility or instant sort of um, cloud by just putting something online. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, then it, and then what we've seen is that those things are oftentimes a, a lift off to a book mm -hmm. <laughs> or another form of mm -hmm. success. Um, and I was just at the Crossroads, I don't know if anybody goes to Crossroads, but they had a demo day for all of their, um, the ocean startups. Mm. And, and every single one was an app. And I was, I left kind of discouraged. And even hearing you talk, I'm partially, I'm, I'm partially revitalized in the fact that bringing back a lost art. But I'm also discouraged because it's like, is this what we have to do as creators, like to be relevant and to succeed, is to like get on the board with some technological stuff? So hmm. that's just sort of like what's swirling around in my head. And I'm, I don't know, I'm just wondering your thoughts or anyone's thoughts on that because um, it's definitely something that, that presses against my creativity hmm. and makes me direct. Yeah. Well, I think that we're ending. I, I'm, I'm just a guy who plays guitar at the end of the day, so I feel, I feel a little weird offering too, too many opinions, but I, it is something I think about. And I suspect that in the music industry and to a lesser degree in the publishing industry, we're at the end of what was a sort of uh, a bubble, you know. When I was a kid, if you became a whip-ass guitar player, you were pretty much, if you were a reasonable person, you could make a living doing it. Um, now what I tell people who are interested in going into music is that you need to pretend that you're a classical portrait painter. And that if you love painting portraits and you're passionate about it, you should do it. But no, no one that I know as a classical portrait painter, with a few exceptions, has any illusions about making a living doing it. And that if you're, if you're passionate about music or recording or writing, you do it because you love it. And it's, it's going to go back to the thing where one in every 150,000 people makes a living at it and the rest of us do it because we love it. So I, I, I kind of feel like that was a, maybe it'll come back, maybe it's a dip and it wasn't a bubble, but it feels like a bubble. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can uh, totally relate to a lot of the conversation just because it's like you have birds both sides, but I have a little bit of a devil's advocate kind of a thought. Mm -hmm. Creativity is sort of being a function of stimulus, and it's an iterative process. And I wonder, you know, the whole notion of technology and digital being able to expose you to so much, so much more. Um, does that enable you to actually, you know, stimulate your creativity more than you would have in the analog world because you just had access to a lot more? Um, and if, you know, what would be the trade-off of that versus your? You know, I guess what, what do you think about that? Well, yes. I think, uh, first of all, I, d I have no idea what the word creativity means. And I, I, think, I, know what you, well, I think I know what you mean. But I, when someone it's says... Very new ideas, I guess, is what I'm saying. And the whole idea that's a function of getting exposed to an array of different things. I mean, yeah, I guess if I ever had a new idea, I might know what you were talking about. <laughs> but I, 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 yes, I think that having a wider range of access to more information should be making us have an explosion of, of beautiful work, right? Where is it? I don't know. Maybe it's out there. I, and I'm not, I'm not negative on that at all. There is a lot of beautiful work happening. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I really don't know what that word create. I, I, I know what it means in popular culture, but I, I, can't, like, I can't get up in the morning and say, I'm going to be creative today. It makes me feel like my mom's handing me some craft supplies or something, right? <laughs> like, I just want to get up and I want to try to make something beautiful. And sometimes that means I'm stealing something from Bach, and it's not a new idea. But it's, you know, it, yes, absolutely, we should be doing great work because we have access to so much. And, and I think, 
I, I think that maybe we are, you know, maybe digital is going to have an up, maybe, and I say digital, but I just mean like access to the world. Maybe that is going to have an upswing. I think it, it has to. It has to. But if it doesn't overwhelm us by having too many options, <laughs> you know, that's the other thing is that you look at some art from, from 17th century Japan where they'd never seen a white person, and it's mind-boggling, beautiful, because they only had this much to work with, and they made amazing things, you know. So it, it can go either way. I would argue both sides of that, but I think you have a good point. I think, I think that kind of, what Steve said kind of touches on what the other point was. Uh, there's not really a premium when everybody's a celebrity. You know, anybody with a phone, anybody can record their song garage band, you know, from stock on some computers. When there's such an oversaturation um, and, and over, you're over simulated, you don't really focus on, okay, well, what's good and what's meaningful to me. It's just, there's everything everywhere. everywhere. Right, and that's, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I was saying about everybody having all the knowledge of the world in their pocket. It makes it, yeah, go ahead. How do you set constraints on yourself and not get sucked into having everything everywhere? I, mean, I really do. I try to, um, the last recording, the last big recording that I made, I forced myself to use no, um, no digital effects, no reverb, no echo. <laughs> No, um, comp you know, I, I set myself very, very strong boundaries, and it was very freeing because, you know, you know how it is in, in Photoshop or whatever. Like you open up a thing, and there's like, okay, what kind of filter do I want to use? Which of these six thousand filters do I want to use? I was like, no, I'm not going to use a filter. I'm going to do it. I'm going to have to. I'm going to take 17 pictures until I get it right. You know, and so I, I do actually set boundaries for myself, and actually project by project. And I encourage people I'm working with to set boundaries too. You should see the looks on their faces. <laughs> We're not going to tune my vocals? Whoa, <laughs> brave new world. It's like turning off your phone when you go on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard to do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Going once, yes. Could you talk about your creative space at the monastery and maybe your event on Saturday night? Oh, well. If you insist, <laughs> checks in the mail. So I, 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 um, I own a, um, uh, somehow or other, I bought a church that was an Episcopal church that was built in the late 1800s. And um, phew, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, but it's a 6,000 square foot church and it, um, I put a recording studio in there, and there's a performance uh, space also in there. And um, it's, a, it's a big, beautiful, unbelievably expensive to heat space um, with no insulation and occasionally raccoons. <laughs> but we do, um, we do some amazing, uh, gosh, we do some amazing music there. And I, I'm, in, I live, I'm in Walnut Hills, so we're in this very, like, Walnut Hills is like the, the like you could drop a bomb and kill 70% of the hipsters in Cincinnati if you hit on <laughs> Walnut Hills. It'd be like, be like beards and suspenders everywhere. <laughs> Paps Blue Ribbon. Um, but it's also, it also has this history of being a really old African-American neighborhood with tons of amazing history. Harry Beecher Stowe's house is there. The Lane Seminary abolition debates were there. So it's a very... Uh, I hesitate to use the word diverse, but it's an incredibly diverse community. And we bring in music. This Saturday, we're bringing in um, a, a, a film composer and guitar player named David Torn, who is a, he's an old friend, but he's played guitar for David Bowie, for Tori Amos, for John Legend. He's worked with Ruichi Sakamoto. He uh, composes film scores. He was on the film score for Traffic. I mean, I could go on and on and on about all the stuff that he's done. He's playing a concert there on Saturday. But you can, uh, there's a f relatively high percentage of the kids in my neighborhood that don't know any music that was made before 2010. So it's a little interesting juxtaposition. <laughs> but that's, uh, if you're interested, uh, I think it's mon monasterystudio.com if you want to check it out. So thanks so much. Thanks, Jeremy, for having me. Thanks for listening. You guys are really nice.